there anything you want to say about, other than what you've mentioned so far, about your work with the correspondents, not only Cronkite, but Mike Wallace, Bill Leonard, Edward P. Morgan, Charles Collingwood? Right. Um, uh, oh, and the Don, he killed himself. Hollenbeck. Don Hollenbeck. Extraordinary man who would do the London Sunday Times crossword puzzle using only the vertical or the horizontal, not both. <laughs> uh, it's, it is, there's a great deal to say about that. Uh, I, this is only a th my idea. I, don't, I, I, I couldn't prove it. I don't know whether it's so. That news department, uh, there's a reason for the myth of it. The myth is true. It's not a myth. They were extraordinary. They were great correspondents. Uh, they were probably a little left of center, just a hair, not, nothing very radical. Uh, mostly they were in love with their work and serious. Uh, they wrote their own. They didn't read a text that the way it's done today, uh, that somebody else had written, uh, Walter would be at that typewriter. Uh, not on You Are There, because it needed a certain introduction, little, and certain background facts. But uh, on his own show, uh, Walter wrote his own, as did almost all the correspondents. When the blacklist came in, CBS had a much tougher time than NBC. I could use actors. By that time, I think I was freelancing. Uh, we're, we're further along, I was freelancing. I was going, doing shows on NBC and CBS. And I could use actors on NBC that I could not use on CBS. The reason that this happened, I think, and this is all supposition on my part, I know that uh, the most intense fight of the whole blacklisting period came about because they wanted to break up the CBS News Department. They were convinced. By they, I mean the Red Channels people, the American Legion. Uh, it probably went up to HUAC, would be my guess. That uh, Oh, communist ridden, these left-wing guys, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Paley, it's the only time Paley put down, no, the News Department is untouchable. Now, I don't know whether he did that on his own or because he knew that he would lose Murrow if he gave in that much. Uh, they were particularly after Don Hollenbeck. Uh, Harry Reasoner, who became quite a, if I remember correctly, became fairly right wing when he became a commentator on a ABC. You're, you're not thinking of Howard K. Smith, are you? No, I'm not thinking of Howard who K. Who also became more conservative when he left and went to ABC. It might th it, then it might be it might be you know I'm dealing with a lot of years and a lot of names ago. It might be Smith. I'm not sure whether it's Reasoner or Smith. At any rate, it was with an H that I remember. Uh, but uh, I don't. As I say, I don't know whether it was Murrow or whether it was um, Paley himself. But the result was that there was far more blacklisting pressure in terms of actors on CBS. And in terms of directors, uh, I know my co-director on Danger, when we first began, Kurt, I couldn't remember his second name. I think he was let go because of blacklisting. I think Marty Ritt was let go on producing the show. And Charlie Russell took over because of the blacklist. And I had my own run-in with him. And my life was saved by Mel Block, another lot reason. I'm eternally grateful to him. How, how did he save you? He didn't knuckle under. When uh, he called me one day and he said, Sidney, your name has appeared in the American Legion magazine. R the American Legion magazine was one of the code, uh, code sources to start Mr. Johnson in Syracuse with his postcard and letter writing campaign to the sponsors to get rid of uh, Sidney Lumet or, or this one or the other one. And uh, he said, I'm not going to give in. And about five weeks, six weeks later, uh, 
he said to me, he, Sydney, uh, the pressure is enormous. They have taken Pay toothbrushes and Amidon toothpaste off the shelves in all of Mr. Johnson's supermarkets and in a couple of other cities because uh, it was very organized. And he said, we're just taking a brutal beating. Uh, he said, I'd like you to do two things. And if you say, if you say no, I will understand it's totally your decision, and I, then I will then try to back you as long as I can. Uh, but I'm telling you, I've got real troubles. I said, what are the two things? He said, I'd like you to go see Dan O'Shea. And if all goes well with Dan, then I'll, uh, then I'll talk to you about he was I operating, I really, the, the CBS internal he was in charge of blacklisting at CBS. Right, is exactly. what it amounted to. Uh, the the <coughs> the everybody was salving his conscience. Uh, there were no her consciences to be salved in those days. Everybody was salving his conscience uh, by saying, "Oh no, he's trying to protect your job." Uh, the fact of the matter was, he was uh, he was doing the Inquisitor's work for him, and. Uh, was he the head of General Tire and Rubber? I think he was. He was a great Catholic lay contributor to the church and so on. He was, silly word to use, kosher beyond kosher uh, in terms of his Catholic bona fides. And, uh, and there were Catholic organizations involved in the blacklisting. And uh, as you know, there, there was Legion of Decency involved in the movie pressures, too. And he had been hired by Paley. He had his own office at 485. I came up, I saw him, a uh, very civilized man, gentle, nice. Couldn't have had a better conversation. So good, in fact, that I was leaving. I, I said to him, Dan, how can you do this job? And then he said the most remarkable thing. He said, better one of us than one of them. Now, I mean, it shows you how, how we can rationalize our own actions. I'm not saying this pejoratively at, ab about him. Uh, I'm sure I'm capable of the sel same self-rationalization as, as we all are. He actually thought he was doing something constructive and helpful. He was doing their work for them.